So how many people in here grow blueberries? You know a hell of a lot more than I do about this, so I'm subbing for Chris. Chris is lying on the beach in Florida, so I am pinch hitting. So ask questions, but be gentle, okay? So one of the things that started out this project is we noticed that particularly in the suburban belt, central Maryland, with our upland soils, that the growers were having problems with blueberry bush vigor. That, that we were getting, make sure I get it. You know, just inadequate growth, die off, you know, getting this kind of thing. Um, and we wanted to know why. So, what's going on? So, we know as far as what blueberries need, all right, they need, they take up, I'm in the wrong place, they take up nitrogen um, as ammonium, not nitrate. So, there's your fertilization schedule right there. You're going to need a more acid soil. Now, something you need to know about blueberries is that they have a symbiosis with mycorrhizal fungi that's specific with ericaceous plants. Are you impressed? Those are big words. All right, it's called a hartig net. And because they have this hartig net, it's a little bit different than some of the other crops that you grow. So that's one of the things that makes them difficult, maybe a little bit harder to grow. Now, you guys out here on the shore, you have the advantage of us people in the central, central Maryland, okay? But soil acidification is going to be very important, all right? And you can use your ammonium sulfate fertilizers to help kind of keep it acid, but you may have to use sulfur to drop that pH. So when you drop pH, makes that heart net happy, but what it does is it increases plant toxicity uptake in manganese and aluminum. So those are toxic elements. The manganese is, is necessary to a point, but it gets over a certain point and then it starts being toxic. So we know that New Jersey, okay, New Jersey have those peat, sand, bogs. That's where these plants evolved in. They like that sandy, peaty soil, very acid, excellent, exquisite drainage, and yet just the right amount of moisture when they want it. Um, we, we, we don't have that in central Maryland, so we make do. And a lot of times we're seeing growers transitioning into perennial crops like blueberries coming out of row crops. So we're looking at a lot of compacted soil, and that's going to be just the antithesis of that perfect drainage that blueberries want. So does it sound like we're trying to put a square peg in a round hole? A little bit, yeah. But you're talking about a high value crop, great for pick your own. So, you know, we're farmers, we want to try it. So, we are in the transition zone between the optimum areas for northern high bush and the optimum areas for southern high bush. How many people out here grow southern high bush on the shore? You're all northern high bush. Interesting, okay. I may actually have something to tell you, all right? So what we found, or what Chris has, has, has noticed, is southern high bush on the coastal plain show greater vigor than northern high bush. You know, you want yields. You also have to have a berry that's going to be appropriate for your clientele. So how do we get there? Um, in the transition zone, just a note, usually what's recommended for us are northern high bush varieties. Mm -hmm. So that may be a good thing and maybe a bad thing. More pictures of commercial plantings, what we'd like to see and what we sometimes see. So we started, or Chris started, a trial out at the Turp Farm in Upper Marlboro. And what we did is we had 40 Blue Ray and 40 New Hanover. So we trialed northern high bush against southern high bush. Um, this was, by the way, a capstone project, so this was all done by students. We like to, our slave labor, I mean our, child, our students, yeah. Okay, and one of the things that Chris was, was thinking about at this point was, would a containerized growing system have advantages over in-ground? So that's kind of what the driving force behind this particular trial, although... Um, things that the results were kind of interesting. So we had in ground, we had the soil at Upper Marlboro that was augmented with pine fines, and then the containers um, were two, two and a half, three gallon standard uh, nursery containers, and they had a sand and pine fine mix. 
they were put on drip irrigation, and they were hand fertilized. The um, soil was acidified with sulfur. There was glyphosate used to take down the perennial weeds, and it was covered with a landscape fabric. So we first noticed that that initial year, we had tremendous vigor out of these plants. They were really growing well, and even that first year, we were getting flower buds. Um, they were taken, leaf samples were taken at second leaf, and again in 19... I mean, 2019. So 2018 and 2019, leaf samples were taken for analysis. Um, yeah, okay. So this is what we found. Oh, there's, there's the installation. Yes, sir. I have a quick, a quick question for you. In these two and a half gallons, there are mm -hmm. Now, when those plants grow out, that stuff that you're in Oh, I hear you. So what, what difference is having to observe? Well, we're not, okay, so this planting, this trial is not that old, and a capstone planting, you guys probably not in the system don't understand that or don't realize that our seniors and juniors have to go through, in the plant science department, have to take a capstone class where they actually put together through a monitor and I've, I've, a mentor, and I've been a mentor a couple of times, a project. So this is a student-run project, and it was set up for a specific, to answer a specific question. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a woody plant girl here, all right? I'm, a, I'm an arborist. So that was the first thing out of my mouth, and my thoughts was, so what are we going to do in year four when we've got this, you know, plant that's gushing out of a three-gallon container? But that would be a continuing trial, and we're not taking, we don't have the enthusiasm to take it any further. So... That's a really good question, but just kind of like take a look at the trial for what we can give you information-wise, not that this is going to be a solution. Okay, so it's got inherent issues. All right, so there's our, our trial. Now, you can note that, the, that we don't get much help from the staff. That is supposed to be student-weeded. All right, so we started off nice and clean, but um, yeah, then it degenerated. So that is our initial planting. So this is what we got, all right? So here's our Blu-ray, our new Hanover, Hanover in ground and containerized. And for the sake of this trial, we're actually not going to talk about comparing in container with in ground because we had more fun with some other things. So here you've got nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and we're looking at all right, just what our values are. And they're, they're nitrogen pretty much straight across the, the road here. It's really similar, nothing remarkable with our macronutrients. And just kind of look at the Blu-ray versus New Hanover for the sake of argument. This is a lot of statistical stuff, and it doesn't signify. But then we, get, we got to the micronutrient leaf analysis, so we've got iron, not significant. Whoa, wait a minute, manganese, what? Blu-ray versus New Hanover, all right? So the northern highbush are taking up twice the amount of manganese. That could push toxicity. Aluminum, fairly high, but here is the fun part. Look at sodium uptake. The northern highbush were taking up again twice the amount of sodium. This was the dark horse. What the heck is happening there? <coughs> so we went on to do some greenhouse trials because we can control the environment a little bit more closely. So the bottom line here is, do we have a problem with sodium toxicity in northern highbush varieties? Mmm, begs the question. And that's why we went to the greenhouse trial. So now we had about 400 and some odd rooted cuttings that were potted up. We had five northern highbush cultivars and six southern highbush cultivars that we compared head to head. And we potted these little guys up in containers, um, initially commercial potting medium and pine fines. Um, when I came on, they were bumped from fours to one gallons, and I added perlite to the mix because they're on ebb and flood. And remember, blueberries need really, really good drainage. So I had some issues from a cultural standpoint of are they going to get too wet 
in ebb and flood, are we going to get some root rots in? And yes, actually we did, which is why I changed the medium. So we're using ebb and flow or ebb and flood fertigation. And then, oh, they're, and they're arranged in four randomized complete blocks. That's that statistical thing again. And we took... Oh, ebb and flood irrigation. So this is something we can set up in the greenhouse where we have on the bench here, actually. Why don't I just go here? On the bench, all right, this is in our, our wonderful research greenhouse, we have these trays. And you can see that they've got kind of furrows moving this way and that way. And a fertilizer, fertigation solution is pumped from the tank into these trays, and they've got a little bit of a lip. You can see it right there. So that gets filled, stays for about a half an hour, then drains off. So rather than overhead irrigation, now we're doing fertigation through the ebb and flood. And that's, um, it's a nice, tightly controlled way of managing both their moisture level and their fertilizer level, okay? So it just gives us a very uniform playing field. Guy, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay, fine. All right. All right, so we did leaf analysis, um, sent them to Penn State, probably the same place you send your dry weight analysis in the summertime. And there we go, beautiful, beautiful. Oh, and they got to summer outside because greenhouses, they get a little toasty in the summertime. So we kicked them outside and put them <coughs> in cold frames and they grew like little weeds, I'll be happy to say. And by this time, they're in, they're in one gallons, okay, one gallon uh, nursery containers. And they're on drip irrigation, so they're happy campers. All right, so here we go. <sighs> Northern highbush, these are our varieties, all right, northern highbush. And let's take the micronutrient leaf analysis because that was the interesting one. And just let's, for sake of argument, just look at the means. So iron, okay, mm. manganese, again, running a little high. What's going on with legacy? Legacy is a dark horse. Watch it, okay? Legacy is another story. Um, Aluminum, all right, 9.6. So what are those funny letters? Well, that means that statistically they're the same. So your A's are one group, your B's are another group, and your C and your D. So that's a statistical thing. If you're really into that, that means something to you. So we're, you know, manganese is high, but whoa, here comes sodium. Wowzer, all right? really high sodium levels again. And now we've got the greenhouse trial where things are a little bit more tightly controlled and we're still seeing this dramatic uptake in sodium levels in northern highbush. So remember that number, because here's our southern highbush, all right? And again, let's look at the means. So iron, not remarkable. Manganese, look at the northern mean as, composed, as prepared, bleh, compared to the southern mean in manganese, remember, necessary for growth, but it can get toxic. All right, so what's this northern highbush doing more? Aluminum, eh, okay, pretty much the same. And look at sodium again. So our southern mean, 162, is opposed to almost twice the uptake in northern highbush. Sodium is toxic. Sodium is really going to mess with your bushes. And now in our greenhouse trials, we're seeing that we've got this high sodium uptake by our northern high bush. So is this what's causing us problems? Um, do I have? No, I don't have the slide comparing legacy. Legacy turned out to be an intergeneric or an interspecific between northern and southern. So we could almost do a study just looking at some of these northern and southern crosses to see how they perform. And again, we've got to have good <coughs> saleable berries. That's always there. So some of the conclusions that we came to, Chris came to, <laughs> I'm just a hanger on. All right, minimize sodium and fertilizer and soil amendments. Where are we going to see sodium? Composts, manures, high sodium. So this is when you start putting together your fertilization regime, how you, I know you want an inexpensive fertilizer. You want high, you want high OM. How are you going to add it? 
So sodium has to be part of your formula that you look at before you choose your soil amendments. We've got this varietal selection. Northern and southern hybrids may be better for our mid-Atlantic states. Um, legacy, again, Chris points this out. Longer chilling hybrid, all right, but definitely lower sodium and manganese levels, so is this absorbing less of those toxins? And those toxins are going to retard plant growth and plant vigor in the field. So we need to do more stuff, all right? We always need to do more research. Yeah, always. All right, so we need to drill down and look at sodium uptake as a predictor of upland ad adaptation. Now, we know we've got soil compaction. We know that sometimes we don't have the OM that blueberries would really like to have. We know we don't have the drainage, but is our lives being complicated by high sodium and manganese levels? Is this just adding to the complexity of our lives? Um, there's a little deal with nitrogen levels being inversely related with vigor. Um, that's a, a question that Chris can answer to a little bit better than I can. Um, it's to me that's not, that was a sidebar rather than the main deal. So for breeders, thinking about incorporating southern highbush parents, the ones that have the longer chilling hours with northern highbush to get the ability, the, the inability to absorb those toxins maybe, better vigor, and still maintain good fruit quality. And I'm going to I'm going to pause right there. Any questions on that? I, I've got one. If you get an opportunity to add another variety to your study, take Chandler. My field observations of Chandler across a number of blueberry growers, when you see uh, the uh, blue crop, blue ray, and Duke, which is uh, go, yeah, go Duke, south, yeah. Yeah. that variety does well on those sites. And you just got me thinking, I'm wondering what its sodium tolerance and its magnesium, uh, manganese tolerance are. The other thing, the use of pine pines, pine pines have a native pH of about 3.8. Uh -huh. So if you start using a lot of pine pines for your mulch, you're going to get that pH to go down. Yes. And you're going to wind up lime and blueberries. I've had a lot of mine three times already at 500 pounds. Now, are you pine. on the shore or are you central Maryland? I'm on the shore and I've used pine pines. I've used pine pines. You guys have it easy. <laughs> it's, it's easier yeah. to grow, but I'm just telling you that yeah. it's a variety that acts totally different than either the, 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 the whole pruning regimes on it's different. It's almost like a little tree. But it has taken off on some sites where I've seen, uh, 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 oh boy, the brains are going, oh, not O'Neill, uh, Duke. Duke, yeah, and, okay. And Blue Crop and Brewery sort of go south and some of the others, yeah. and it's just going like a champ. This one it's particular site's also growing some uh, oh the other southern variety that's uh, if I hadn't had a stroke it'd come up to me. Uh, It'll come to you eventually. It, well, no, it, they're, they're, they're the, uh, the plants that grow real tall. Plants that grow real tall. Come on, my shore growers, help rabbit them out. Eye, that's it. Thank you. Which one? Rabbit eyes. So oh, rabbit, rabbit eyes. Oh my gosh, yes. So I've been on sites, well on and they're they're if, monsters. If, if you got a chance to put Chandler into that study. Yeah. Let's we'll see what happens. It okay. All right. Are, are you are you going to give us some grant money? I don't want any grant money. <laughs> <laughs> no, we want grant money. <laughs> no, and this is really really good. Again, I'm giving this talk that focuses on the issues in Central Maryland, and I'm giving it on the shore. What am I doing here? All right. So really good insights. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Um, can I? When um, so when you're doing Okay, this is a nice basic question. We were, were we monitoring the pH in the substrate? In the greenhouse operation, absolutely. Because this started out at Upper Marlboro as a capstone project, and they weren't my capstone, I can't answer that. But that would have been something that I would have said, I want, I want your pH monitor. Because although we treated the soil with sulfur, I don't have any evidence that we did any post-treatment studies. But Regardless, sodium is the star of this talk, or, the, or the, the, the evil person in the talk. And we get the same thing with the greenhouse trials as we get the in-ground trials. But yeah, pH is always an issue. And it's interesting to see your take on pH in the shore 
of pine fines dropping it too low. Like, oh. It depends what you're using. But yeah. Dr. Gouin was the one that was a big fan of pine fines, and, and he, he recommended a lot of people to use it, and, and it works very well. Yes, it does. But it's got a native pH of 3.8. But he see, was, we need that in he, Central he Maryland. It's basically <laughs> anti the hardwood chips yeah. because they were high in manganese, and when you got that pH down, you bumped into some yep. issues. So manganese toxicity. I, I, think, I think part of the thing is, is you've got to just know what you're using. In Georgia, they basically are growing blueberries and fine bark beds. Yep. You're growing them into pots, but they just basically- No, we're, 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 not, we're not doing them in pots, them thank God. All right, and great insights. You all, like I say, I started this talk by, you all know a heck of a lot more than I do about blueberries. But here's some basic culture for anybody out there in the audience who doesn't know. So pH is a big deal, you just heard. Um, your organic matter should be between two and 5%. A lot of times the fields I see out here on the shore, it's higher than that. But that would be something that when you do your soil analysis that you look for your organic matter, percent organic matter, and your CEC, cation exchange capacity. Um, the other thing that you probably want to look at, maybe not so much on the shore unless you're in a clay-based soil, is your textural analysis that gives you the percent clay, silt, and sand. Compacted soil looks like compacted soil, and I hear a lot of people say, oh, I've got clay. And I'm like, no, I do a textural analysis. You've got compacted silt loam. Still a problem, but it's nice to know what you're dealing with. Um, leaf analysis samples in July. Start looking for sodium. I know you guys, you're good growers, you send those leaf samples out, and that helps you monitor your fertilization program. Start looking for sodium. It just may be just one of those interesting little things that'll um, will tell you a lot. Um, fertilizer application, the efficient time, uh, your maximum efficiency in your fertigation, pruning and controlling weeds. Now this is after Gary Pavlis, who you all know who he is at Rutgers. Um, I know you probably all have, your blueberries are all pruned, aren't they? Huh? You're not pruning your blueberries yet? Yeah, I know, but we're having climate control, cl climate change here. It's warm. All right, sir. When is the most efficient time for, I'm getting ready to fertilize. When is the most official, efficient time? Hang on to your seat, because I'm about to talk about that. All right, oh, okay. good job, good job. All right, so that's basic pruning. You all know it, all right? And this will be recorded, so if you're needing guidance, you can take a picture of that slide, but I'm going to move on. Because fertilization, all right? So 10, 10, 10 at bud break, then six weeks later. But now Dr. Pavlis is saying, you know, it's better to spoon feed these guys and spread out your application over six weeks starting at bud break. So a little bit, little bit, little bit, rather than dump and dump. He's seeing higher yields. And maybe in central Maryland with this kind of regime, we will see more vigorous plants. Um, there's now his, this is his recommendation on 10, 10, 10. Year one, 100, 100 pounds per acre, um, all the way up to year eight, all right, 650 pounds of nitrogen per acre, okay? And that's his recommendation. Again, you guys are gonna know more, but here I think is some interesting takeaway. This is your optimum leaf analysis nutrient range. And I imagine you all are taking a July analysis on your blueberries, yep, dry weight. You're looking at dry analysis, yes, I see. Heads nodding, good job. This is kind of your takeaway here. And again, y'all know more about it than I do, all right? Oops, and something happened to my last slide. All right, never mind. But it was a picture of blueberry cobbler, which is what I know about. How can I take some, can I take some questions? Now, be gentle, because I'm not Chris Walsh, but. Yeah, quick questions. Uh, you'll be here through lunch. So. I will be here through lunch. Yeah. All yeah. right, thanks for your attention, guys. The only thing that, to bring up, Gary has sort of moved away from that 10, 10, 10 into more of a ammonium salt base and a urea program. And there we go. Ammonium that's what I know about With eating. Salt, eh, the pH is 4.5 and, and yeah. uh, higher. Use ammonium sulfate. If it's 4.5 and lower, use urea. 
with yeah. our nutrient management programs in Maryland, we yes. really need to stay away from that phosphorus if we don't need it. Yes, absolutely. I just heard him speak a couple of weeks ago, and he was still doing the 10, 10, 10, and I kind of went, I scratched my head, and I didn't have time to question him about it, so I'm glad you added that he's moving away from 10, 10, 10, because with our, we are in the Chesapeake Bay, and that's something we want to protect, so nutrient management laws are going to be important. All right, I, I am out of here.